Hi, and welcome to another episode of Wildstorm Addiction. This is episode 6, and we're going to be covering comics for the week of 616. And this week we've got something a little special for you before we get into any of our reviews. Uh, ben was actually able to meet creator Steve Niles. So he sat down with Steve and asked him a few questions about his upcoming uh, Wildstorm crossover, uh, X-Files and 30 Days of Night. So we're going to turn it over to Ben's interview for a little bit, and then we'll return in just a moment with our reviews for the week. Hello and welcome to a special edition of the Wild, Wild Storm Addiction podcast. We're semi-live tonight at the New Dimension Comics in Cranberry Township, along with 30 Days of Night creator Steve Niles. Uh, Steve is here signing tonight for his latest creation, Mystery Society, but we're going to ask him about his upcoming project, with Wildstorm, X-Files 30 Days of Night crossover. Say hello, Steve. What? <laughs> say oh, say hello yeah, to our hi. audience. Thanks yeah. for having me. <laughs> no problem. That's good. Thank you. I'm trying. <laughs> um, so, uh, Steve, how did you get your start in the industry? I just heard you talking to another customer. Um, but it was pretty, pretty early on. Yeah, it was 1985, 1986, and I just self-published some stuff. Um, I, uh, I actually wrote Richard Matheson a letter, basically saying, you know, in your book I Am Legend has been, like, screwed up at that point only twice, you know, in, in movies, and um, he went up, he sold me the rights to I Am Legend for a hundred bucks. Oh, wow. So that was sort of, like, my first big break. Mm-hmm. I was, like, 19 or so. And uh, I started doing, I self-published for a little while, and I did some stuff with Clyde Barker, and then gradually I just, you know, I just, I kept hammering away at it, and I was, actually, I had already been doing it over 15 years when 30 Days came out. So. That's awesome. That's crazy. Like, at 19, you went to another writer and mm-hmm. to get his, oh, yeah. his work, basically. What, yeah, I mean, what yeah. propelled you to do that? I don't know. I, I don't know too many 19 year olds that would like reach out like that and be like hey I was just, yeah well I was just like that you know little project boy you know I just would always around make, you know, I made super great movies and, that's know, awesome I was gathering my friends together and I did, I did like little self publishing comics and, and then yeah I don't know when but when I got it in my head and I was going to make some comic books I just started writing everybody I knew and, or didn't know and just trying to figure out how to you know get some material together that's cool yeah it paid off. It was really good. I went meeting Clyde Barker through Madison and you know, kind of working with him for years. It's Obviously. definitely worked out. Cool. What were uh, some of your influences? Obviously, some of the people that you reached out to. Yeah, I was. I, I've been really lucky and like to actually work with a lot of people that influenced me. Like you know, I worked with Clyde Barker. Uh, just you know, uh, I just finished a project with John Carpenter. I was like, you know, he's huge inspiration. Yeah. Did some stuff with George Romero. You know, early on, um, you know, and all these guys are people that I just love. Like, I'm, you know, I'm working with, with Bert oh, Wright's right now, mm-hmm. and I grew up, you know, with his stuff. Giant fan. So, but Rich Benson, as far as writing, he was always one of the big ones. He just he wrote tons and tons of great stuff. Um, Fiona did the cover of that. Did, uh-huh. did you get to work directly with her at all? Oh yeah, yeah. We, you know, luckily thanks to Skype and stuff like that. As long as she's yeah. In, She's in Calgary, That's but right. um, I work really closely with the you know, artists whenever I can. You know, I don't, I don't obviously get to be in the same room with them very often. Right. But you know, I always I leave stuff wide open, you know, for her to throw in her ideas. You know, she pretty much came up with the look of the lead characters and and their clothes and stuff. Like that. I don't have a shop. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Joe and I are big fans of her because she's done a lot for Wildstorm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, she uh, she did North 40. Yeah. And she got nominated for the Eisner for that. Yeah. So, yeah, she's really yeah. great. Um, so, X-Files 30 Days of Night is releasing on July 14th. Uh-huh. Um, did you initiate the crossover with X-Files, or was the idea presented to you by they, someone else? They brought it, Wildstorm, IDW brought it to me, and they had three or four different ideas for crossovers and this and that was the only one I was just like okay yeah I can see those you know I can yeah. see that, that kind of working and I had just started working with um, 
Adam Jones at that point. Um, and he's, you know, he's obviously, you know, made his mark in, in music. He's in uh, Tool, plays guitar for Tool. But he's been wanting, he wants to do comic books for some unknown reason. So, um, I called him, because I wasn't really sure about it, and I asked if he would help out on this project. It could be sort of a test for him, for him working on comic books. And uh, it's worked out great. Sure. He, came, he came up with the twist. That really made the whole thing work, but I can't, can't say. But um, I'm actually, you know, from going from kind of something I, I really wasn't sure how it would work to now, you know, we've got four issues done now. I'm really happy with it. And I think, like, X-File or Land or 30 Days fans will both be happy. Um, did X-File's creator, Chris Carper, have any influence or... Uh, yeah, Carter. Carter. Sorry, <laughs> I can't even read my own Chris notes. Carter. Yeah, um, sorry. Did Chris Carter have any influence in the series? If not, would you? Uh, we had to get approved. Yeah, by right. and then Frank Spockmitz and those guys yeah. all had to sign off on the scripts. Okay. And so, uh, the story. you know, so that was really nice when they signed off and said yeah. we were getting the characters right. The dialogue yeah. was was on. <laughs> awesome. Good news. All right, this one's coming from Joe, but because you know, my my co-host Joe, oh, okay. he, he he wrote a couple of these questions, and honestly, I don't know some of the background, but um, <laughs> it's all about awesome. <laughs> all right. The the recent movie that came out, X Files, I want to believe, offered some closure of sorts to the series. Um, you know, in the post-credit scenes with Mulder and Scully, um, you know, heading towards the tropical tropical island, and uh. He wants to know why why revisit that now. He's uncounted, so you just take. Okay. Yeah, I took one. He's assuming what happens after that. that. We did. Okay. So and all right. Why? They asked. Okay. There's some, <laughs> you know, no. Yeah. That's why some. Is, that's some good insight. Not leave well enough alone. <laughs> no, no, no. That, that's a good insight. <laughs> no. And also, I haven't seen that movie, so I didn't know that mm -hmm. so they were living on a tropical island again. <laughs> well, no. That's good. Good insight right then, right there too, because I don't. I don't think we exactly know the timeline of when this happens. So. I'm assuming it's that. Well, because it's all been, this is a crossover with the comics. <laughs> right. So the comic, 30 Days, came out in 2000. I right. could always just so. do them a later. That so. was around the first movie, I think. Yeah? When the first X-Files movie came out. The one with the bees. Oh, what's that one called? Oh, uh, the truth is out there. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah, that one was okay. Yeah, I like all the little mini. Uh, the monster, monster of the week. Monsters that right, exactly. Yeah. Monster. Well, I like stopped. Home. home is my favorite. I stopped watching yeah, you know, X Files you know, uh, yeah. when Very it was confused. first out back, like in season three. Yeah, he knew mm -hmm. After the um, episode with Bambi in it. I didn't see Not me. Um, it's the one with the cockroaches. In the fertilizer factory. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> at that point, I just kind of gave up for a while, and oh. I've been rewatching them. Do you remember the one home? Um. That you can only watch on DVD. They won't play it on TV. About the I have inbred. I remember. Oh yeah, that's on Netflix. I have Netflix. Set in Pennsylvania. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. That was the joke when it was out. Like, oh man, we finally get some. There's cuts. there's a bunch of them set in Pennsylvania, actually. Just so you guys know, that's that's uh the model of the uh cover of the one of the variants for the new dimension comics variants of mystery society number one that's dj sci-fi what's up and <laughs> todd the proprietor of uh ndc i just pay all the bills <laughs> <laughs> um, he just buys the beer try to anyway <laughs> nice. thank you babe besides right. obviously following the two main character you know two main characters of uh x-files um, okay. What other references to X Files lore or Thirty yeah. Days of the Night can fans expect? Yeah, the well, the 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 I know I can't give away too much of that stuff. There's other, <laughs> you know, there's other X Files, you know, characters from the X Files that will appear. All right. Um, and with Thirty Days, we got a quick try to find that. Hmm? It could, you know, some <laughs> surprises I don't want to give away. Okay, let me tell you the ending. A really good tie-in would be off um, uh, three, the uh, series. I think it was season two, maybe, or season three. Uh, three. That was the name of the episode. Exactly. The one where um, the, uh, David Duchovny's girlfriend in real life was in it. The vampire. Right. <laughs> the vampire one. Mm -hmm. That would be a fun tie-in. <laughs> the majority of your work seems to focus on the supernatural. Mm -hmm. What's it for you personally that's appealing about the supernatural? 
Why do I like horror? Is that why horror? Yeah. That's why horror. Yeah, that's why horror. <laughs> why not? Because I had a horribly traumatizing childhood. <laughs> <laughs> Dr- drink it out. <laughs> yeah, that or yeah. Um, I don't know. You know, I've just been a fan since I was a little kid. You know, I, I, I don't know what drug me drive, and I really have a lot of fun. And every time I seem to try to, I mean, even Mystery Society, it's pretty not horror, but already macabre stuff is creeping into it. So, yeah, that's one question I've never been able to answer. No. It's okay. You don't have to. It's fun. Pass. Yeah. <laughs> it's fun. I, I should just go with childhood trauma, though. <laughs> Are you texting while interviewing? Hey, I am. Oh. <laughs> 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 Sorry. That's the best part of the interview right there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Steve's like, I've sunk this low. Uh, no, I can't no. even compel. The guy that wanted to interview me, I can't like even be compelling. Him. It's, it's my wife. I can't not do that. Sorry. <laughs> Honey, don't kill me. I'm buying yeah. comic books. Yeah. <laughs> I have a funny story about that. <laughs> so, does the new crossover allow for a sequel of mm-hmm. the series? Yes. Awesome. These are yours. And okay. That'd be, actually, it should be really fun, actually. Dry, I'm so dry. Are there um, any Wildstorm Universe characters or titles that you'd like to tackle? I know no. my co host. <laughs> no? <laughs> <laughs> did I say that too quick? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did. Wait, but I, got Jim Lee I mean, you got there. Wetworks. <laughs> Wetworks is vampires. Yeah. All right, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> hey, did you come up with those things for me, Todd? Thanks. All right. Wilds from that. I'm, I'm really, I'm doing that. Fun stuff with Wilds from too. So this is a good thing with their universe. Okay, fair enough. Right, Kip. Yes, ben Abernathy is my editor who be edits be all these titles. Who's supposed to be in it? There's my wife. He's going to take it personally. <laughs> <laughs> and your wife. Well, I, I haven't even <laughs> tried on I was telling her to come in. I don't know. She, she, Because you were calling me. I'm sorry. It's going to be a great episode. Yeah. I wasn't sure. Come on in. Oh, no, no, no. It was fun. Sarah, Steve, Steve, Sarah. Hi. Good to meet you. At least you don't have that almost live feed. It does, yeah. Alright, I'm gonna skip one of these, but uh, last <laughs> one. What? What are you skipping? Is it personal? <laughs> no, it's not. It's Another just, 30 days X No, no, it's just one that I'm not familiar with. Number 10. Yeah? Yeah, we're rolling. Talking about the Spectre cartoon. Mm hmm. You wanna do it? Uh, yeah, I guess. Right. I mean, now that we're talking about it. Alright, I guess we should. <laughs> yeah, that would definitely work. My co host loved your uh, Spectre animated short, Very which was. I, I never got to see it, Steve. I'm sorry. Jeez. You act like I have all this time to take in all this media. Anyways, he wants to know if there are any plans to script another animated project. Hopefully. I'm actually, I, I'm talking to them about some other stuff, but I'm, but I'm also I'm also talking to DC about maybe doing more Spectre. That was a lot of fun. Is that, is that something that you like to work with, that other kind of media? It's funny, like, when yeah. bring them here. It was really, I was really surprised, you know, yeah, one, they let me do PG-13. Yeah. Okay, that's all I'm like, so, I know I grabbed yeah, 10 of them. I was able to, you know, do a little mini horror movie with, you know, with mm-hmm. super mm-hmm. characters, so it was fun. Mm-hmm. 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 Just um, time, if you could super pick one supernatural creature to be, which would you pick and why? To be? To be, actually be. It's like, it's the superhero question. What what superpower could you have? <laughs> I don't know. I stumped them. You did. You stumped me. Yeah. Kind of sick of vampires. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, yeah. Nice, nice okay. poke at Wetworks. That was good. What? It was a poke at Wetworks. That's no, cool. it was a poke at myself. Mm-hmm. Vampires. No, I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know. I really didn't know Wetworks had vampires in it. That's, that's what <laughs> I remember works. the toys. Yeah, that's... You're just going to get me fired from Wildstorm now. Thanks. Would you need him to send this? Please. But Todd, do you have any questions you'd like to ask? bust in that for a minute? Yeah. Oh, that way I can't say it. Done. When do you want to start drinking? Yeah. <laughs> I already you made my offer. offer. It's Todd now? <laughs> no, I haven't done Todd for a long time. No, I think I, I, I had two Here. questions about the book. One I already asked about the word we can't say on your podcast. And <laughs> that's, question. that's the S word. Remember. The S word. <laughs> Suck. <laughs> Suck. Yeah. I think because he can't see it on TV, I think that's a bit of the line for us. 
so it's not not liberal yet. You know, maybe HBO, you know, but you know, like you can say it on network. If the kiddies can't see it at you know ten o'clock at night, even I don't know. It's just, I had the same fight with uh, the S word after like seven p.m. Now that just needs to change. Yeah, I it's don't it's disagree. It's, in, it's probably only once, but I don't know. well, it was only once in his comics. So. <laughs> All right, fair enough. But right. if it's only once, if it maybe it's, can do it. it, it it's and, you know, I don't think it was a pivotal part in the story that needed to be. Here I'm criticizing the guy who's scribbling autographs. <laughs> <clears throat> it's not a criticism; it's a question. I'm just curious. Way to get your if there was thought behind it, or if it was just you just. That's what you wrote, and that's Thanks what you wrote. Dialogue. Just try to sound natural. Mm-hmm. Obviously, everybody I know has a foul mouth. <laughs> well, are we I, still on the air? No. I certainly hope not. No. <laughs> Anyways, I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Okay. I'm, I'm sure all the guys. What? What? No, I. I'm just. I'm trying to say I appreciate the interview, and I, I'm sure all the fans out there will enjoy listening to it, and are looking forward to the crossover that's coming up. Yeah, send me a link. Absolutely. Yeah, just through my website, Steve at SteveNile.com, and then I'll post it on all my Absolutely. There's your plug right there. <laughs> oh, did I? I thought we were like we weren't recording. Oh, yeah, we are. <sighs> wow, what a crazy interview. I just, uh, again, want to thank Steve Niles for uh, coming out and agreeing to do the interview with me while he was doing a signing at New Dimension Comics in, in uh, Pennsylvania. And, uh, yeah, I don't know what you guys thought, but I'm really looking forward to the crossover. It sounds like he included some juicy tidbits for us to look forward to. Yeah, it's really cool that that he agreed to do that. I got to meet him when he was here in Texas about two weeks before, and he was really nice, really cool. So, yeah, uh, that that always makes me pumped for for any project that a creator's got, you know, when you get to meet them like that. So, Absolutely. Anyway, we're going to go ahead and move on here to to a, uh, a review that uh, a lot of people were asking us about, uh, see what we were going to do, which is the original graphic novel, A God Somewhere, which is written by John Arcudi, with the art by Peter Snedgeberg. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Peter. I, no way I could find out how to say your name. And Bajarne Hansen, I guess. Yeah, and, I, I suckered you into that one. Yes, you did. <laughs> No, I knew. I I mean, I'm I really I really do apologize. You know, there is no way. I I wish there was like an online place you could just go and listen to the creator's name somewhere. <laughs> you know, seriously. Yep. Um, because I really do want to say it correctly. Um. But anyway, um, a god somewhere, like I said, is original graphic novel. Um. And it's one of those that. Uh, you know, we saw it listed a few months back, and since it was creator-owned, you know, we we debated about whether or not to cover it since it was a graphic novel, which means that you know, it was going to be a lot more expensive than just picking up a, even a six-issue miniseries. Hmm. But uh, you know, both Ben and I both the both decided to get it, and I think we both can agree that we do not regret it in the slightest. <laughs> Absolutely not. Yeah. Um. A God Somewhere, let me just preface it by saying this. You, you've probably, a lot of you have probably seen around the net that it's gotten a lot of praise, a lot of good reviews. I, I just want to preface it by saying this is when, stuff like this is when the comic medium is at its best. You know, they took this, and even the fact that they chose the graphic novel format as compared to a miniseries, that's the kind of thought that was put into this book. And as Ben and I get into it, you're going to see just, I mean, just how much thought was put into this story. Um, real quick, my only experience with writer John Arcudi came when he, um, he did the original uh, Gen 13 run. He did, uh, he did a run, uh, I think, somewhere 25 on into, thir- into the 30s. He had a nice, he had a nice run. And back then, I, I just remember I, I didn't enjoy it as much. So when I saw that he was going to do this, I remember, well, you know, he's a decent writer. But I tell you what, with these being his own his own creation, he just knocked it out of the park. Mm-hmm. Um, from page one of A God Somewhere, you know that, first of all, this story is going to be brutal. <laughs> 
Um, it is a mature reader's title. And I'll just say when you open up and you see basically a little girl crying at her mother's feet. And um, by the way, there are spoiler alerts. <laughs> uh, always forget to say that on our podcast. Um, because this is just too, there's just too much here to not, to not talk about spoilers. Um, you got a little girl crying at her mother's, at her mother's feet. And basically her mother is missing half her head. And there's this raging inferno around them. And you're like, what is going on? <laughs> and, you know, next page, we go to something more pleasant. So it's like, right away, Arcudi's teasing us with that something, you know, very bad is going to happen in this graphic novel by the time all is said and done. Um, the good thing about this is that we follow uh, four characters. We follow um, two brothers, Eric and Hugh Forrester. Hugh has a wife named uh, Alma, and then we also have uh, his Sam. best friend, Sam. Thank you. Yeah. I was, how did you know I was going to ask you his name? <laughs> Sam Knoll. Sam Knoll, yeah. It's funny the way that, that uh, you do get to learn the characters' names because they do repeat them kind of conveniently here and there. It's not forced, but he does it enough to where you, you do learn their names pretty quick. So, um, Arcudi takes some, takes some time to just kind of give us the feel for these characters. You know, Eric Eric seems kind of like the adventurous one, and Hugh seems like the reserved conservative one. They're having a simple discussion about buying a boat, which all three, all four of them can use. Um, Eric works for UDS, which is a you know an off uh, uh, a take on UPS, obviously, and. Um, so, so Arcudi just takes time to to show us these characters, just show that they're they're normal people, just kind of uh, dealing with you know, I mean, simple little pro, simple little issue of buying a boat. You know, we get a little we get a little bit about their best friend Sam, uh, who is African American, and apparently uh, gets given crap by you know some of his other African American friends for hanging out with Eric and his brother all the time. And so it kind of shows you that Sam kind of feels like a, I guess like an outcast, because um, they're always bothering about that. And then Arcudi takes us into uh, one of the strengths of this book, which is he uses flashbacks to kind of give us little little origin stories, I guess, for each character. And the first origin story we get is how how Eric and Hugh met Sam, and it's the it's the classic, you know, he's in a, he's in a southern school and oh, I'm sorry, am I saying that right? I don't remember where exactly they are, but I remember he's the only African American in this school when he's a young kid. Is that uh, correct? I, I I'm not exactly sure where the school is. It doesn't seem it's somewhere in California. It's Los Angeles. He, he had I, just moved from Oakland. His father got a new job. It's Los Angeles because one of the bullies is looking at the Los Angeles Times. I just saw that. <laughs> it's on page 10. So anyway, so, uh, you know, of course, they, they beat up Sam, and uh, Eric and his brother Hugh come to Sam's rescue, and that kind of shows that that's the first time that they um, that they all meet each other. And, and, and these boys don't beat up Sam just because he's black. I mean, maybe they do. It's because the L.A. riots were happening at the time. Mm -hmm. So... That's their instigation right there. Yeah. Yeah, because they start off by yelling at him and s calling him the N-word. <laughs> yes. And uh, then we fast forward again, and, you know, um, we're back in present day, and apparently the guys are watching the, or watching the game. And this was kind of a weird scene to me. I don't know if uh, how, which, what you – I'm going to get your take on it, Ben, in a second – but the scene where where he's asking about the the science magazine talking about the metal storm, which is like meteorites coming down, and uh, basically they end up making fun of Hugh for that. I, I I didn't catch what exactly happened there. Did you Did you get a clear read on that? 
I, I didn't take too much from it. They were kind of making fun of him for being a geek, like why he would think that that would even be possible or something. Because mm-hmm. at first, when you see this, you think, well, gee, this metal storm they're referring to, maybe that's going to play into the story, you know, because sometimes, in, obviously, in you know, superhero lore, there's, either, there's always some catalyst, and sometimes it involves you know, stuff from outer space, and that's where I thought this might go, but that just kind of le- got left by the wayside. Yeah, I think it's kind of a throwaway or just a nod to, you know, previous literature. Yeah. So anyway, after that, you know, they have a fight and kind of shows that Hugh feels really distanced from his brother, Eric. And, you know, of course, he has his wife, Alma, to comfort him. And Sam, you know, pretty much has nowhere to go. So he kind of goes to a lookout point that oversees the city. And all of a sudden, there's a huge explosion in the middle of the city, you know. So we're 20 pages in, and that's about, you know, the length that Arcudi has taken to to establish these characters. And, and by now, you really have a good sense of each of them before we get into, you know, the really fantastic parts of this story. Because basically what happens next is, you know, the explosion turns out to be Eric's apartment building, and it's just gone. You know, it's just reduced to rubble, and you, you see a quick glance of that scene from earlier of the girl... Uh, you know, trying to wake up her dead mother, so you get a quick sense of where you are now. And Sam runs down there and finds Eric amongst the rubble, just sitting on his the remnants of his bed. And he just looks over and says, "Hey, dude!" <laughs> and you're like, "Okay, what's going on here?" He survived a mini nuclear explosion in his apartment, basically. So from here, the uh, like I said, this is where the this is where the story, you know, starts its fantastic parts, or the superhero parts, I guess you could say, you know, because basically Eric Eric gets taken to the hospital, and from here on, Eric just has this euphoric look on his face most of the time, like as if he's just so happy that whatever has happened to him has happened, <laughs> and the next scene was kind of. Apparently he hears that there's still some some people out there who need some help. He's in the hospital. There's nothing wrong with him. You know, there he's no no cuts, no scrapes, no broken bones, nothing. And of course, all the doctors are freaking out. You know, all this is kind of kind of classic superhero stuff. You know, that you've seen before. You know, the guy gets his powers, and all of a sudden everybody's freaking out about it. And the next thing you know, he's running down the hall, jumps out the window, and literally just flies off into the sky. <laughs> You know, and that that part for me was a little like, okay, that's cool, but it's, uh, you know, why is he just all of a sudden able to do this? Like, he doesn't even play around with his powers. He doesn't practice. He just, boom, he just can do everything. You know, what did you think about that, Ben? It, it, it's instinctive. Oh, uh, okay. Is that what you got from that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can see that. And maybe that's part of that look that I'm talking about. Uh, I mean, did you notice that? That it did pretty much, I mean, up until a certain point in the book, but here in the early parts of the book, did you notice that his, he just always had this look in his face like as if he knew something that we didn't, you know? Absolutely, and I don't want to discuss it right now. <laughs> okay. Well, that's fine. I just want to make sure that I wasn't the only one. No, you're not crazy. But, um, but yeah, so basically Eric, who's now pretty much naked, uh, arrives at the, at the scene of the apartment explosion, and uh, here we get a, here we get one of of at least two Superman homages that I noticed in this book. Uh, one is where he's picking up a piece of rubble, and one of the camera crew is taking a shot. At, you know, and, and basically you see that classic, you know, Superman lifting a, you know, piece over his head of something heavy. I've seen it. I've seen it done dozens of times, but I thought it was a nice little nod. Yeah, but you don't normally see his junk hanging out. <laughs> no, not normally. <laughs> not in any official DC publications. <laughs> but um, so basically, you know, this is his introduction to the world. He, you know, the world has its first superpowered person. Further into that, we get another flashback, and this time it shows us how how they met Alma for the first time. Uh, it was actually Eric and Sam who met her first. And through them, introduced her to Hugh, and apparently somewhere down the line, she fell for Hugh, and that's how they got married. But of course, everybody's freaking out, everybody's concerned about Eric, and Eric just decides to go take a nap. (laughs) He goes with Sam to his place, and Sam's 
calling Hugh and they're just discussing what should we do, what's going on, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's very appropriate, <laughs> you know, I, I, I felt like this is exactly what, everybody was having the right reaction to this and that's why Eric's attitude was so, uh, I don't want to say out of place, but it was so noticeable because everybody else to me was reacting to this exactly the way they were supposed to. They were freaking out, <laughs> you know. And next morning, Eric wakes up, and the first thing he's doing is perched out on the window. This is the part that I thought was really cool. He, You know, he's talking about, you know, that that what happened to him is a miracle, you know, because uh, it is established by the way that he is a, that he's a Christian. So, um, and I think it is important to mention real quick that, that uh, both Ben and I are as well, and that's the perspective we're both coming from this, because I know I'm going to bring some stuff later concerning that, that uh, if you're not, you may not, you may not have picked up on some of this stuff in this graphic novel. But, and I'm not sure what our Crudy's beliefs are, but if he doesn't believe, he definitely did his homework for this one. <laughs> but then he turns to Sam and says, you know, I don't want you to be afraid. Everything's going to be all right. And he proceeds to jump out the window. And that's the end of chapter one. <laughs> Yay. Which um, I'll just say real quick, it's interesting that he chose to break these up into chapters because they're 48 pages each. So that doesn't, I, I don't think that, that he would have done a four issue miniseries of 48 pages each. So it's obvious that he planned it out that way. But it kind of allows for passage of time too. So anyway, I'll let Ben take over chapter two. Well, before I get into chapter two, let me just say a couple things about chapter one. And you're right, this book is very well paced at, mm -hmm. throughout how he broke up the chapters, how passage of time works, everything just works. It just seems to make sense. I can see why people are loving this around the internet. It's just, it's great. And there was two flashbacks in the chapter one. They're very defined. You know exactly when you're reading um, a different time period. The borders around all the panels are a different color. It's very obvious. Some books we read that change time, you have no idea what's going on. Oh, this wow, book, that's a, that's a good It's very, very clear when you're reading something, whether it's present or past. And it, later on in the book, there's actually flash forwards. It's still a different color. You know that it's a different time period. Um, and like Joe had just mentioned, there's a lot of Christian imagery at the very beginning of this book. Um, Eric especially, he's wearing a cross all the time. Eric is kind of like a surfer guy. He's clean cut. He's a clean cut white boy, but he just has a surfer attitude and mentality. He has longer hair than his brother Hugh. Um, and a couple pages worth, he's wearing a WWJD shirt. So oh, there's, yeah. <laughs> there's lots of references in here about that. And later on, it's really important why. Mm -hmm. Anything else about chapter one? Because there is a lot to go through. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. That's, that's it. I, was just, I, I just thought those were cool observations. I didn't notice the change of color in the panels and stuff. Yeah. So that was a really good observation. All right. I'll move on to chapter two. There's four to go through, everybody. And it's well worth the time that we're putting into this because this book is just awesome. All right, so chapter two. Chapter two opens up on um, a, a group of policemen being pinned down by two heavily armed bank robbers. And they're also armored, so the police can't seem to take them down. This goes on for a while, and then Eric flies in and pretty much just backhands these two bank robbers. And... You can't really tell, but there's a lot of gore in this book, and it seems like their faces got smashed in. You, you don't know. Later on, it says that they sue Eric, so I guess they're still alive, but it, it didn't take much to take them out. We'll just say yeah. that. <laughs> um, and, then, and then we see Eric is given a penthouse suite at a local high-end uh, hotel for free. And, you know, they mentioned really quick that this is good promotion for the hotel, Eric has to kind of keep a low profile because the media just keeps wanting to go after them, after him, sorry. Um, they can't seem to get an interview with him. Nobody knows really why he, why or how he got his powers. So he's trying to m maintain a low profile. And even the hotel themselves haven't told anybody that they're doing this pro bono. 
Um, Sam visits Eric at the hotel and tells him that, you know, he, he doesn't even know his own powers yet. So he's pretty concerned for him because I guess Sam was concerned that he didn't know that he was bulletproof, but he just kind of flew in there and took care of those two bank robbers without even thinking about it. So like I was saying earlier with chapter one, it, it's, it seems kind of instinctive to Eric. Like he just, he seems to know that this was something that he always n- knew was going to happen to him. He even goes on to tell Sam that, you know, even Jesus wasn't afraid. So any who are righteous should lead by his example. And uh, he believes that his gifts were given to him by God. And Sam was never a believer, so he's kind of freaking out right now, <laughs> as they all are around Eric. Um, and then we move on to a flashback of Sam moving in with Eric um, into his crummy old little apartment. And Eric even says that he'll hook him up with a job delivering packages with UDS and help him. As Eric's kind of helping him move and unpacking. Eric finds a picture of Alma that Sam had had in his stuff while he was moving. And he kind of is like, dude, why do you have this? Like, this is my brother's girlfriend. Like, give it up. Because in that first interaction, the very first flash forward, we see, you know, or flashback, sorry, the second one at the end of chapter one. We see that Sam really liked Alma at first, and she didn't really have any interest at him in him at all, but totally had eyes for Hugh, like, immediately. So uh, he just tells him to give it a rest and that it's never going to happen. Like, they're dating. Get over it. And then uh, we flash back to the present. I'm, I'm sorry, I just realized that that was a flashback. We go back to the present, and... Um, Alma and Hugh are having their fifth wedding anniversary. So they're having a big party at their house. And Hugh is all upset because Eric didn't come. And obviously Eric's kind of laying low because of all the media hoopla around him. And uh, Miss Forrester, Eric and Hugh's mom, says that she'll take care of it and starts calling all around and tracks down Eric and says that they'll all meet tomorrow for church. So then we go to the next day and we see Eric at church and he's kind of at the front pew and then everybody's all spaced out behind him and he's kind of separated and he's like, he has that weird euphoric face again. We go outside and we see that Eric's family is trying to get through the the mob of media and, and they can't get into the overcrowded church and the church already has too many people and it's a fire hazard and they're frustrated and ticked off. So... After the end of the service, Sam sneaks Eric's, Eric out of the church and gets him to Hugh's house. And they all kind of catch up, and this is the first time that they all see each other after the big explosion event that happened to give Eric his powers. I guess it gives him his powers. We'll find out later, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, Hugh's finally relieved that he gets to see him because he had been so scared about what had happened. And in this scene, we finally start to see Eric, Eric's facial features change. Like, he's starting to get scruffy. And he had been clean cut at the beginning of the story. And you'll see this change throughout the story as well. And even after they catch up, the media starts to show up at Hugh's house. So they even find him there. And they feel trapped again. So now they try to get out of there. And as they're getting out, they can't get through all the press. So Sam and Eric are trying to get to their car. And Eric just had enough of it. And he just flies off in such... I I don't know if he's ticked off, but he's just frustrated. And he knocks everybody to the ground around him. Except for Sam. Except for Sam. (laughs) That's important, actually. (laughs) Next, we see that Eric even has a full beard by now. And uh, Sam is giving interviews with the press because, you know, Eric keeps trying to get away from them. And 
for a change, this is something that Sam likes because Sam has always felt like the odd man out between the three of the the guys. So he's soaking up all these interviews. He's totally excited about it. Um, next we go to a rally. We see that, that the President of the United States is given a rally. It must be in the L.A. area. And Eric flies in, and he kind of disrupts this rally. Um, he had planned to meet with the President later, but for some odd reason, he was really excited, and he just wanted to see him. He meets up with Alma in the middle of the rally, and he realizes that Hugh isn't there to see this happen, and he's really disappointed about it. And she tries to explain to him, well, that boat that you guys were all going to buy, he's trying to take possession of it right now. And if he's not there to take possession of it, they'll lose the boat. And I think Eric is more disappointed than anything. And he's kind of wondering why Hugh is even bothering with the boat at this point. So Eric flies off from the rally to go talk to Hugh on the boat, which... The president is freaking out about this whole ordeal, why, what just took place, because he just flies in to disrupt his rally and then flies right out. So Eric and Hugh have this conversation on the boat, and they're kind of upset at one another. Eric is has concern for Hugh and Alma. He really wants to protect them. So he, he wants to try to get Eric to, or Hugh to move to a better neighborhood because there had been some recent robberies and break-ins in Hugh's neighborhood. I think Hugh tells them, Hugh is having problems with Eric getting all the attention, not, not in a way that, you know, he wants attention, but he just shows concern for his older brother. Eric, in this meeting, he realizes that Hugh isn't necessarily showing concern for him, but he's actually scared of Eric himself. And this flips Eric out to no end, that his, his own brother is scared of him. This is where things start to change, change in Eric. And he's pretty upset, and he flies away from that boat scene, and he goes directly to the original meeting that he was supposed to have with the President of the United States and the mayor of the city that they're in, I guess L.A. And he's soaking wet because it was raining, and he just comes trudging into this this boardroom, basically. This boardroom scene isn't pleasant. This is where, like, that previous meeting that he just got away from with Hugh, he just snaps. He just starts to understand that even the president is scared of him. Even the mayor is scared of him. If Eric's not on their side, they're, they're concerned. They don't know what he can do or what he can't do, basically. So at this point, Eric realizes that you know, these people are scared of me. I can do anything I want. You're just a man. He actually calls the president, you know, you're just a person. Who are you to, you know, be president of the United States, basically? And you see the shock on their face. And they have legit concern at this point. They're scared. And, and even at this point, Eric even asks, you know, during that summit with the president and the mayor, he's like, why didn't you get Sam here? Sam's his best buddy. He's like, I asked you to get him here. Why couldn't you even do that? He's pretty upset all around. Things seem to not be lining up with his timing, what he wants to happen. I mean, small, simple things, but it's enough to set him off, and he's, he's not enjoying what's going on with it. So now we go to a flashback of Alma giving the first kiss to the best man at you know her and Hugh's wedding, and that happens to be Sam. This is really quick. It's just thrown in there, but... It's something that Sam really holds on to and latches on to. Everything about Alma, he really takes to heart. And he, like I said, he seems like the outsider of the three. So this is really important to him. We go back to the present, and there's a couple beat cops checking the Forrester residence. And this is the neighborhood that you know Eric really wanted to. Hugh and Alma to move out of and he actually at one point asked the mayor hey can you please check out the neighborhood make sure that my brother is safe and his wife is safe so that's what these beat cops are doing they're, they're checking out the neighborhood they see an open door at the residence that they're supposed to be protecting and they freak out they're like oh no something's going on it's at 2 o'clock in the morning so they're like this, this can't be good so they go in to check the residence and 
first thing they see is Hugh on the ground, beaten and bloodied. And they're like, oh no. They call for backup. They keep going further into the house. And you see Eric with Alma behind him, obviously battered and bruised. And it's obvious that Eric raped Alma. And this is how chapter two ends. (laughs) Yeah. Eric is totally flipped. (laughs) Yep. Yep. Definitely gone crazy. Any thoughts on chapter two? Yeah. I mean, like you said, this book does have a a lot of Christian imagery as we keep going, you know, you know, that, that look on his face, like we said, it's very euphoric at the beginning, but as he starts realizing things, uh, he doesn't have that look anymore. In fact, for example, like like right before he, he flies into the and interrupts the interview that Sam was giving with the reporter, you know he's flying. Uh, Eric's flying in the clouds and he's got his arms outreached. You know, obviously a, you know, a reference to Jesus Christ. You know, and even when he uh, arrives at the presidential, you know, uh, rally, and he's you know hovering above the crowd, and again he has his hands you know out and open towards them, and his hair is longer, and you know, like like he said, his he's more scruffy now. And there's that scene, you know, right after that where he's on the ground and all these people have their hands around him, you know, just reaching out to him, reaching out to him. He's just got this huge, you know, smile on his face. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good pickup, like when crowds would gather around Jesus and he would just heal them just by them touching his clothing. Yeah, so that that, that really reminded me of that a lot. And uh, by the way, Sam, uh, Sam was nowhere to be found because uh, he found a couple of girls who were there to see Eric, and then they found out, you know, that he was Eric's friend. So they go and they get a hotel room, and and he sleeps with both of them. So that's, <laughs> yeah, that's that's yeah. why the president's men couldn't find Sam. You know, and he's actually looking at a picture of Alma right after, and that's what leads to that wedding scene you're talking about, that wedding flashback. That's correct. Yeah, one interesting thing I will say, just in general about Eric, which is which really caught me, was that. You know, like we said, he's Christian, so, you know, we know what he believes as a Christian, you know, or what he probably believes, I guess you could say. So for him to get so frustrated at at men like this, it's like he's basically frustrated that men are still corrupt. I guess he considers himself a miracle before men, you know, and it's basically, I got the feeling like he's before them saying, look at me, you know, I'm proof, you know, that there's a God and all of you are still acting you know like the jerks you were before you know i came like like this to you you know you know it kind of reminded me uh just real quick you know you'll know what i'm talking about that story of lazarus in the bible not not the lazarus that returns from the grave it's a it's a parable that jesus talks about of a lazarus who went to hell and who basically told god you know let me go back god just in time to tell my family not to come to this place because it's so horrible and God basically tells him, it doesn't matter if you came back from the dead, they still wouldn't believe. Yep. And that reminded me of this right now. It's basically, that's what's happening to Eric. You know, he's gotten these powers, which, you know, like, I understand that he's attributing it to God. While the president and the rest of them, I'm sure, are trying to figure out, you know, another explanation, which, which is totally believable. I, you know, that's exactly what would happen. You know, it's not like they're all going to believe Eric. They're like, oh, yeah, you're right. It's from God, you know. <laughs> Uh, so that's another thing about this is that I totally believe that this is exactly what would happen, you know, but the thing is, is that Eric has made a choice. He, he has chosen, you know, to basically take the corruption of men and take it personal, I guess, you know, Mm -hmm. and take it upon himself. It's, you know, to, to do something about it. But the thing is, I guess, is that he, I guess he takes it so hard that that's, that's, that's why he just basically resorts to this, to what would be the selfishness. Which is like, okay, I'm just going to do what I want, you know, because I have the power. And the first thing he goes and does is he takes Alma, you know. And it's like, wow, you know, you want to talk about absolute power corrupts absolutely, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's exactly what's happening here to him, you know. And that, that was what was really interesting to me about this, is that that one little realization about man and the nature of man is really what drove him over the edge. Or at least what I see at this point. And, you know, I don't know if we'll see more as we go, cause that, but that was the one thing that stuck with me 
It's like I, I couldn't believe. It's 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 almost like if he is a Christian, he sure threw his teachings out the window with that one, you know. <laughs> yeah, and you you see his facial expressions change when he's at that summit with the president and the mayor. Like he is truly upset and disappointed, and then he goes to rage. And mm-hmm. within a few pages, you know, he's turning his brother into a quadriplegic and raping his wife. It's just. It's brutal and it's quick, and you're like, "Wow, it's very, very shocking." Yeah. So, no, that was, that was that's all I got from part two. So, it's de- story definitely does take a dark turn there. <laughs> yeah, it does. Take it away with chapter three. Yeah, but wait, there's more. <laughs> it gets worse. <laughs> it gets worse. <laughs> yeah, like Ben said, uh, you know, chapter three picks up with basically. You know, Sam is going to visit Eric in a maximum security prison where apparently he voluntarily surrendered himself. And like like Ben said, you know, Hugh is in, he's basically, like you said, he's a quadriplegic now. And Alma is in, you know, you know, in the hospital, but they, she doesn't want to see anybody. And, you know, they try to tell Sam not to take it personally. And, and he goes and um, tries to talk to to Eric, who they have, you know, in a cell. Obviously, Sam is trying to find out what is going on, you know, and Eric, this is where Eric just becomes very, starts to become very cryptic with his answers, and he just... Sam Sam wants to know why he can do something so wrong. Yeah. Especially with his upbringing. Yeah. And that and that's, yeah, that's what I was about to say. You know, he basically says wrong. He's like, wrong is just a word people made up it has nothing to do with the real world and he's like no your world you mean and it's like and this part was was pretty interesting what eric says next he says i had a dream the other night and he basically talks about that he says i was a god somewhere in another universe a smaller universe you know and basically they worshiped him and he grew bored (laughs) with that universe so he decided to come to ours (laughs) And I thought that was interesting, and obviously that's where the title came from when he says, I was a god somewhere, which I thought, by the way, this book was originally supposed to be called Chosen, but there's already uh, more than one comic out there that's called that, uh, but I know there's one in particular. But I think that title was more appropriate for this book, and I I love the double meaning of it, you know, because it's obviously part of this little story he tells, but, you know, the fact that for people in the world now, there is a God somewhere in their world, you know, somebody who can do these fantastic things, even though all of a sudden he's doing them, you know, to using his powers to do horrible things now. But uh, it's never clear if that's an origin, but that is a that is an interesting possibility, the fact that he was a God somewhere else and then decided to come here. You know, basically, Sam tells him that he's a monster and Eric just kind of smiles you know, smirks, I guess you could say. Tell Sam that he's glad that he came and they glad they could talk and he decides to burst out of prison at that point since that's what he could do at any point. And this is where this book just gets crazy. <laughs> because, like I said, since it's mature readers, there is no holding back. And they take advantage. Uh, I haven't mentioned, I'm not going to say his last name anymore because I don't want to butcher it, but it's Peter, the artist. <laughs> His art in this is just really good. Up until you know this point, we've seen a lot of great facial expressions, a lot of great scenes, a lot of detail. I mean, he, I, I don't, I didn't research see what else he's done in the past, but but his art here is is just is just really good. And here, he gets a chance to do some all out action. The man can draw some gore. Yeah, <laughs> this guy could do well to draw the authority i think <laughs> but uh but yeah basically we go into eric versus the military and uh he starts by taking on a tank <laughs> and i mean there's just some awesome shots in this battle i mean this is a amazing battle i mean he takes he takes a a shell you know direct hit and you know all it does is shred his clothes so he's pretty much naked again you yeah. <laughs> know and you know, as funny, as, the funny thing is, that's exactly what'd be happening. You know, you're getting shot at. You, you know, you're getting. Yeah, his he his clothes wouldn't survive the stuff that he's going through. So I totally get why they keep doing that. 
What's funny about that, though, is any action movie that you've seen in the last 20 years of your life, that happens to the woman, and we keep saying, hey, that would never happen. But really, it probably would. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because basically he, you know, he grabs the tank and tosses it at a random building, <laughs> which I was like, why, you know... <laughs> And when the tank hits, you get to see people flying out of the building and body parts, and there's a baby, and there's a woman flying. I mean, just, oh, I didn't see that. There's a couple of people who were who were having sex, too, apparently. <laughs> I didn't see that <laughs> earlier. You know, but it's just all this. And even, I mean, that's, it's morbidly funny, I guess you could say. It's uh, it's certainly not a dark comedy, but it's just some of the stuff you're just like, wow, I, that's just crazy, you know. You know, it's just it's the kind of death and destruction that a Superman gone bad, which is exactly what this story is modeled after, exactly what would happen. You know, there would be a lot of people dying just from, you know, there's people who die in this battle from the debris, you know, and that's exactly what would happen. And there's an awesome scene where, you know, military is just doing a barrage at him and he's got this crazed look on his face, which I actually put up on the website if you want to see that panel. Just got this crazed look on his face and he just, you know... Ex, you know, basically turns into a, a self-made bomb and just explodes in the middle of all these soldiers and just, you know, eradicates them all. You know, you got choppers and he's still, yeah, this part. <laughs> I couldn't believe this. He starts throwing the dead bodies at the chopper. <laughs> that was just, I was like, wow. Don't give all the good stuff away. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, well, you you guys have to go see this. I mean... So I okay then I won't give away page one sixteen then because that's a pretty gory page, a pretty <laughs> messed up moment. But we'll save you'll I'll save that one first for you guys who are gonna go buy this. Yeah, and then he takes off. Sam is left there with a few surviving soldiers, just asking why. If he wanted to escape, why didn't he just fly away? You know, and it's obvious at this point, escape was not his plan. Crazy, crazy, crazy. And, he, you know, time passes apparently from there to forward because the next time we see Eric, he looks like a really buff Willie Nelson. He's got, <laughs> <laughs> he's got the long braids and, you know, it's obviously he's been out and about for a long while and, you know, just destroying towns at random. Yeah, it's been about two to three years since yeah. that event. Sam is part of a media crew who's following trying to track down Eric and they're actually using Sam to uh to help since he is Eric's friend and of course he's kind of reluctantly doing it and but apparently he works for what do they call it? it's basically their version of Time magazine ever what they call timely it Timely magazine Timely there you go Yeah that one's never been used before <laughs> <laughs> And uh you know there's there's more I mean <laughs> there's just so much so much gore, you know, with every battle that they engage him in. I mean, these poor soldiers have no chance. Any any way you can think of killing a soldier, I'm pretty sure Eric comes up with it, you know, because I see different ways as we go through. <laughs> and, you know, we get references back to Alma and Hugh, who, you know, Hugh's in a wheelchair now, and Alma's pretty much taking care of him 24-7. This is where they establish that Eric's power is telekinetic is that yes correct mm -hmm. yeah and they actually kind of confirmed that when they i don't think that's a nuke but i know it's one of their more powerful missiles they sent after him and it makes a crater around him except for the little bit of land that's under him and it's perfectly rounded shape you know so you can tell that there's a force field around him so so now we have two you know explanations to his powers and then he walks on air <laughs> yeah yeah, that's true, which I guess would be a reference to the walking on water. Exactly. So, apparently the military figured out this whole telekinetic thing because they developed some cool laser <laughs> that can break through the field. And this is their first chance to try to take Eric out. Because they, when they use it on him, they basically almost just about blow off his foot. So, ultimately, Chapter 3 ends with Eric being... Severely wounded, and Sam, Sam still, just kind of. I mean, he's in a daze. 
I mean, you know, he he's there, but he's not there. I mean, you, you see, you see this part where he's actually a little torn about the fact that his friend is hurt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because everybody obviously is happy that they can finally, they finally have a chance to kill Eric. Exactly. So, what did you think about that chapter? <laughs> it's just, the, the passage of time is done so well. And I'm going to talk about it a little bit right here because as I get into chapter four, there's a lot of back and forth that happens, but it's so easy to read. It's so clearly defined. You have no problem understanding it. It might be difficult for you to understand what we're explaining right now, but as you read this book, you understand it instinctively. It's it's not a problem at all. It, the, the downfall of Eric was just awesome to read and look at. And it doesn't feel rushed either. No, not at all. And I've never seen such disgustingly beautiful artwork. (laughs) Yeah, that's one way to put it. (laughs) I I really want my wife to read this book because it is just, it's an amazing read. But it is disgusting. And (laughs) I'm hesitant to be like, babe, read this book. It's really, really good. Because it's tough to look at. But yeah. so well done. Yeah. Very realistic. So, chapter four. I may as well end this thing. Chapter four begins with Sam's media vehicle that's out in the desert. That's, you know, along with the military tracking down Eric. So, their vehicle that him and a couple other guys who take pictures and shoot video, it breaks down in the middle of the desert. And the military basically is saying, hey, we're going to have to leave you here. We finally were able to hurt Eric. We're going after him to finish this thing. If one of you wants to come with us, great. If not, we'll send for parts and we'll have a driver come out and pick you up. So, sayonara. (laughs) They basically take off and, (laughs) you know, the three of those media guys, there's another guy there as well. They're all kind of the same group recording what, the military is doing to take down Eric. Um, they're all hanging out in the desert. They don't know what else to do. The photographer goes off. He's kind of ticked off at Sam that, you know, the military would have obviously chosen Sam to go along with them, but Sam chose not to. He stuck with those guys. Um, but he storms off. He's ticked off. He just goes off into the desert. And on his way out there, Eric plummets from the sky right near him. So he comes freaking back. He comes flying back to the group going, come see what happened. Come see what I found. And it's Eric laying out in the middle of the desert, obviously wounded. He was still able to fly. Not too well, apparently. Um, Eric, I guess, is unconscious for a while. So lots of photos and videos were taken of him. And then as Eric wakes up, apparently he has more than just... Well, I guess it is just telekinetic because... As he's waking up, he realizes what's going on around him, and he just kind of explodes everybody around Sam. He spares Sam, but everybody else that was standing around him, dead. Uh, how should I put this best? They're all soup now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, those of you who don't like the media will like that scene. <laughs> Next we... uh flashback to Eric, Hugh, Sam, and Alma um, on the sailboat. Now, I expect that this sailboat was one that they just used to rent. There was a, at one point, Eric says, you know, when he brings up the the sailboat, buying the sailboat with Hugh, he mentions, hey man, we haven't gone out onto the boat in three years. So that's what at the beginning of the story, he kind of pushes Hugh that all three of the guys would get together and buy the boat. Well, I'm assuming this is before that point, so this just must be a sailboat that they had taken out for the day Um, because all four of them are on it, and obviously after Hugh bought the boat, none of them got a chance to enjoy this boat. So this is a rental. But uh, they're all drinking, they're all hanging out, Alma's, you know, in the cabin of the boat so she's not out on the deck with the guys and uh sam is you know just complaining that hugh's got the perfect life he's got the perfect woman he makes the most money out of all the guys and he's just got it all going on and uh hugh just explains to him hey man 
it's not that easy. You know, marriage isn't that easy. My life isn't perfect. You might see it that way, but that's not the case. And as he's saying that, Alma kind of catches him. And yeah, he's in the doghouse a little bit, but you know, she just chides him about it. It's not really that big a deal. We go back to the present, which is three years from the event. So this is when Sam's, Eric's hurt and all that. Um, but we go over to the hospital and Hugh and Alma are kind of hanging out in a park. And Hugh is in a wheelchair. He's now a quadriplegic, as you know we found out earlier. But this is the first time that we really see him kind of just hanging out in a chair. And uh, Alma's working at the hospital. And you know Hugh really wants Alma to give up some control and let his mother kind of help them with their finances and other things because, you know, they're really struggling. He can't work, obviously, and that's why Alma's working at the hospital and things just aren't working right, and she just refuses. She just refuses any help from his mother or anybody else. She just doesn't want to feel any pity for what's happened to them. Then we go over, same time period, to Eric and Sam, and after Eric blew up everybody around him, around Sam, he must have taken him back to his home, which is basically a cave in the desert. I don't know if he flew him over there or they just kind of walked over there because Eric's in bad shape right now and Sam's kind of freaking out. He's scared. So I don't know how they got there, but they're there. Not a big deal. By now, yeah. I mean, he made the Willie Nelson reference. I mean, his hair is long. It's (laughs) braided. His beard is very bushy. So, very uh, Christ-esque, I should say, I guess. So Sam, basically, this is the first time that Sam, in three years, gets to talk to his friend one-on-one after he escaped from the maximum security prison. And he is so just confused. It's been so long a period of time that he can't even articulate what he wants to truly ask Eric. He just starts ranting, why, 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 why would you do this? And he even says, he even chides his own self. He, you know, he always finds himself as the reject of the group. He even says, why am I, you know, so stupid? I can't even give you a a good question. I can't even say, you know, all he can come up with is why. He basically thinks of himself as the loser of the group. Then we move on and, you know, they say that Eric has killed over 300 people. So much so that he even just calls them animals. And Sam is like, and and he even says that they're supposed to die. They're just animals. Sam is just like, they're not people. They're, you know, they're friends, they're family, they're they're important to me. And this is where things kind of flip-flop because Sam had always been, you know, he never had a spiritual life. He never really thought anything about it. He just, he loved his friends and his friends were his family. And he can't believe that Eric has gone so far to not even care about them. And then Eric is obviously dying in that cave. And he basically tells Sam, this is your exclusive. You can tell the world the story of me. You know, this is your story. And he he even knows that he's working for Timely Magazine. I mean, Eric found Sam because of that. It's not that he's all-knowing. It's just that for some reason he can... He knows where Sam is at all times for some odd reason. He just has that instinct. I mean, they are best buddies. So then we flash forward from this cave scene, and this is even further in the future. And we see Sam in a doctor's office, and he has some unknown pain in his shoulder and arm, and it's excruciating. The doctor, you know, tries to tell Sam that, you know, this is most likely post-traumatic stress disorder. Have you ever heard of it? And he's like, of course I've heard of it. You think I'm making this up? It's, so he's very frustrated that the doctor just thinks that it's a figment of his imagination. But obviously in the scans, there's nothing showing up. So it most likely is. I mean, he went through a lot. So that was just a short little blip. And then we go back to Eric and Sam in the cave. And there's some soldiers that are pinpointing you know, their location in the cave. Eric has always protected Sam. So he kills everybody outside of the cave that are going after them because he obviously didn't want Sam killed. And even after that, Sam flips out and like, why? Why would you kill them again? And I think Eric's had enough at this point. 
even though he's his best friend, and grabs onto Sam by his chest and throws him, just launches him. But before Sam hits the ground, he lifts him up and makes him fly. He makes him fly between two fighter jets. And at this point, Sam realizes that this is what it's like. I feel like nobody else. He can see at this point that there's something in Eric that makes him feel different from humanity. And Eric gives Sam that little glimpse when he makes him fly. He realizes that he's not doing it on his own, but that Eric probably gave him a little gift to see what his world must have been like before he dies. So he sets Sam down on the ground, and then the two fighter jets bomb Eric where he stands in the middle of the desert, and he is toast. <laughs> he's, he's done. <laughs> From that point on, they kill Eric. The Eric event is over. We flash forward to the pre- uh, further in the future from now. Sam gives Alma a call and she unwillingly, not unwillingly, but hesitantly invites him over to dinner. So Sam has dinner with Alma and Hugh, who is now a quadriplegic, and it's very awkward. Um, Sam's in a good place right now, but, you know, the family has been crushed by what's happened. Um, then we flash back very far, back to Sam in the hospital when Eric and Hugh first bailed him out from getting beaten up in high school. Sam asked the same question to them. Why'd you do it? Why? Why did you save me from getting my teeth kicked in? And Eric and Hugh are with him. And Eric just says, why wouldn't we? He doesn't explain himself, really. He's just like, why not? You know, there is no real reason. Then we go to the present, which was after the Eric event. Like I said, there's lots of time changes here. When you read it, not a problem at all. Sam, driving in his convertible car, talking to his agent. And his agent is trying to talk him into writing a book. He's obviously done, you know, his his article in Timely Magazine, but he wants to produce a book. And his agent is trying to talk him into it, and Sam really does not want to do it. But he says that if he doesn't do it, someone else will. That actually happened right before their dinner meeting. I'm sorry, I got, got things screwed up. So now Sam is driving in his convertible, and he pulls up to a gas station, a convenience store. And he's in the convenience store paying and he's looking at the TV behind the clerk, and it's an interview of one of the victims whenever the Eric event first happened, when that first explosion happened and gave Eric his powers. And she's sharing her story about how Eric affected her life. And basically, she's promoting her book. She's the one that went out and did it. Obviously, someone was going to do it if Sam didn't. So she's going to make lots of money on this, and he's not. But he doesn't care. He leaves the convenience store and he walks out to his convertible and he's towing the sailboat that Hugh bought and that's the end of the story this is how it ends Sam is Sam went through a lot he he, you didn't think that he was really going to be the main the main character in the story but it doesn't in a way everybody revolves around him in some way or another and even though he went through a lot he's content with where he is right now any thoughts joe (laughs) (laughs) yeah no i kind of got a you know life goes on type of feeling from the end too which which was it was good i I guess uh once once eric dies it's pretty much you know just kind of wind down you know the story just kind of winds down after that so uh, real quick the I, i forgot to mention when they shoot eric they do hit him in the side which is, uh, I guess, a reference to Jesus getting the spear, you know, in the side. Oh, I so didn't, I didn't catch that. I didn't catch side. that either. So, and obviously the cave, you know, is significant because, you know, Jesus, you know, was buried in a cave and came out. But in Eric's case, he, you know, there was no resurrection for Eric. <laughs> wow, you're killing me with these so. references. They're great. <laughs> well, I didn't catch this the first time. You know, that's why. That's why going through. And see, that's part, 
you know anybody who anybody who who loves classic uh, or, or comic stories that are considered classic, like Watchmen and Dark Knight and things like that. Especially Watchmen, just for example, you go back and you still find stuff in that story. That's what that's what this one offers. You know, it's like as we're going back and talking about it and. You know, stuff like that just sticks out. And it's like, oh, yeah, why didn't I catch that the first time, you know? And it's just because it's so packed with with stuff. You know, um, just little nuances here and there and, you know, things, not not too many blatant things, things that you have to really think about and that you have to, you have to kind of search for, kind of keep a certain mindset, like I said, and you'll pick up on this stuff. And it may take a, a couple of readings to do so, you know? So, no, just just a really good... Just a really good example uh, of a of a comic, you know. I mean, it's a graphic novel, but it's it's still the same. It's the comic medium, you know, at its at its best. You know, the, that's the bottom line. It's just a really good story. So, do you want to give your rating? I know you already did it on your written review, but just oh. let everybody else know. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I gave this a ten out of ten. I think it's one of the best stories I've ever read, uh, just through and through. It's just. Awesome art, awesome story. It's structured, everything. I mean, I was not disappointed in this at all. <laughs> you know, I even felt satisfied with it. You know, like I didn't, I didn't feel like, ooh, there needs to be a sequel to this or anything. No, there doesn't have to be. Nope. It's done. The story's good. It's done. You know. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I also gave it a ten out of ten. You know, when we first decided to do this podcast and we set up the rating system, I was like, man, we're never gonna see a ten out of ten. Which, if you guys have listened to before, I've gave one issue of the authority a ten out of ten, but uh, and I was crazy <laughs> about it. But uh, yeah, this story, definite ten out of ten, hands down. You don't even have to second guess that it it is amazing. And one of the big reasons why I gave it that is it has an insanely high reread value. You just want to read it over and over again, and you'll never get bored with the story. It's awesome. And no, like you said, Joe, it does not need a sequel. It is perfect. It's buttoned up yeah. right where it is. Yep. So if you've been on the fence about getting this, especially because of the price, and realize it's a, it's a big investment, invest in it. There's ways to find it out there, you know, where you're not going to break your wallet. So anyway. Joe and I just want to thank everybody for supporting us, especially with the move to the new website. And we hope that you're enjoying it, and please leave us comments on our reviews on the site and on the podcast. Thanks a lot, guys. See you next week. Yep, we'll see you.